Hi guys, and welcome to today's video on the irrational numbers, including surds. My name is Darren, otherwise known as Maths Guru, and welcome very much to my channel if you're watching on YouTube, or mathsguru.com if you're watching on my website. Really, really good to see you. Now, yeah, if you are a new subscriber, you can actually watch these on YouTube at Maths Guru. Uh, alternatively, head over to mathsguru.com, sign up, it's absolutely free to do so, where you see all of these videos ordered by textbook with downloadable notes and much, much more to come. So, uh, it's really good to see you. Our learning objectives for today are shown behind me, and basically, yeah, it's to get an idea of what a rational number is, a rational number is, and surds, and be able to identify these type of things and simplify surds. Now, you're going to try and say, what on earth is a surd? I'm coming to that. But in many cases, if you look at your calculator, you'll notice that, generally speaking, it always gives you answers as decimals. Yes, for the CAS calculators, you can put things into modes that will actually show you what we call exact values. But on the whole, they are decimal. So if I have the number 3.1479623 and it goes on, it would be really, really nice if, for example, as midway part of calculations, I didn't have to round this. I could actually use that number. And we know for things like um, when you use Pythagoras theorem and we have one here and two here, then we're going to end up with a bit of a problem with this value here. Yes, we could end up with a decimal. But wouldn't it be nice if we could keep it as some sort of representation of the actual number? Now, as this is the first lesson in this series, there's no real recap. Yes, you've done this stuff before, but basically we're sort of going to segue into a really large part of mathematics. We're going to deal with SERS, we're going to deal with scientific notation, we're going to look at uh, the distributive law, and we're going to try and tie all of this stuff together so that we can see that there are lots of different ways of expressing numbers. We don't always have to round things to two decimal places. Now it says, am I being irrational? Always. But what is a rational number? Well, basically, a rational number is one that can be expressed as a fraction. And obviously, I suppose the first one is a half. There's a fraction. Is it rational? Absolutely. Uh, what about, give me another one. Two thirds. There's a fraction. Uh, four sevenths. There's a fraction. Basically, if I was to put these into my calculator, they would either be terminating decimals or there'd be some sort of recurring decimal to them, which allows them to be written as a fraction. Uh, what about the number three, for example? Now this tricks people. It's a whole number, yes, but whole numbers are also fractions if I divide them by one as well. See what we're doing there? So whole numbers are rational as well. What about 137% uh, for example? Rational or irrational? Well we know that that can be expressed as 1.37, which is a terminating decimal, or 1 and 37 over 100. Again, it is rational. So where we can do things as fractions, it's rational. Examples of irrational numbers, one you've already been dealing with since year nine, is the value of pi. That goes on to infinity and beyond. It does not slow down, it does not stop, and it does not repeat. Not to our knowledge anyway. And so pi is, for this instance, an irrational number. If I put root two into my calculator, again, we will notice that number goes on and on and on. There is no sequence of repeating numbers in there at all. So these are just some examples. Another example, root three, another example, root five, and so we could go on. So this is what we're gonna deal with in this particular lesson. Examples of rational and irrational numbers. So these questions are taken from the Cambridge Essentials uh, textbook series uh, with permission. Thank you so much, Cambridge, for allowing me to use your examples. You guys absolutely rock. So express each number as a decimal and decide if it is rational or irrational. So firing up my CAS calculator, let's see what happens. We've got minus and the square root of three and hit enter. And there we go, we've got minus 1.73205080. Nothing in there at this moment in time suggests that this will actually repeat, that there is some sort of recurring part of this decimal. Um, and in fact, although it looks like we've got 0808, to be honest with you, that's just my calculator rounding that last digit. So in this situation, minus root 3 would be written as minus 1.73205080. Dot, 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 because it's just going to keep going. And in this situation, that would make it an irrational number. Thank you very much. 137%. We've already dealt with that one. I threw that one in as a freebie at the beginning. 137% is the same as 1.37 or 1 and 37 on 100 or 137 on 100. All of these, in which case, are absolutely rational numbers because they have some sort of terminating decimal. What about 3 on 7? Let's see what happens there. If I do 3 divided by 7, I mean, obviously, to me, that would seem fairly simple. Uh, 0 0.4285714428. Now, that 6 there, again, is there because my calculator is truncating it. As it turns out, 
this continues. So realistically speaking, this is equal to 0 0.428571 with that massive line over it. Why the line? Because that basically tells me it's a recurring decimal. And if that was the case, I can actually use this information and convert it into a fraction. But we already knew it was a fraction and in which situation it is rational. So irrational numbers with a root sign. So we're just going to deal now with the irrational. We're not dealing with pi. We're not going to deal with e. I know I didn't talk about e, but we're not going to talk about e. We're just going to deal with irrational numbers with a root sign. So a third is an irrational number with a root sign. So we need to be careful here because a lot of people go, well, that'll make root four a third. No, it wouldn't because basically it's got to be irrational. And can that number be written as a fraction? Absolutely, because root four is two. And that becomes two on one. And so in which situation? Root four is not an irrational number. And so we need to be careful. And we're going to come on in a moment about sort of square numbers and what have you. So root two, root three, root four. Ah, I just said not that one. Root five. And so we go on, yes? Now there are lots and lots of roots. There are not just square roots. There are in fact cube roots. So I can have the cube root of nine, for example. That is not going to give me some sort of nice number because what number multiplied by itself three times gives me nine? Please don't say three, yeah? And so there are, you know, cube roots, there are quartic roots, there are quintic roots, there are all sorts of types of different roots. The ones we tend to deal with them mostly are in fact square roots. So realistically, we should actually write a two there. Um, but convention has it, and we are slaves to convention. It basically says that that has to be just the square root sign without the two on it. Okay, something else you need to be aware of and it's gonna factor very, very much in uh, videos here is the square of a square root. Now, bearing in mind the square of a number, if I've got two squared, it's the same as two times two, which is four. We, we know this. What about if I've got the square root of two and I square it? Well, in which situation that gives me the square root of two times the square root of two. Now, if I did that on my calculator, I'm actually gonna end up with a value of two. But why? Well, if we think about opposite um, operations, we know that a square is basically reversing a square root, or a square root is reversing a square. We could actually have had two squared with a square root over it. Where I've got a square and a square root together, they effectively cancel each other out, leaving just the two inside of it. So if I had the square root of three all squared, then that would actually just be three. And this becomes really important later on. Now, we've had index laws before. We know that if we had something like x squared multiplied by x cubed, we get x to the power of five. They follow some very basic rules. And we know that where the base is the same and we are multiplying, then what do we do to the power? We add them. So these are just, again, a set of conventions, a set of rules that we know to be true and that we can apply. And something else you're gonna to need to know about are the things that I have highlighted here. So we now know the root of x, y. So when I have two numbers multiplied together under a square root sign, I can actually split them up as the square root of x multiplied by the square root of y. So for example, if I have the square root of two times three, that's the square root of two multiplied by the square root of three. And bring up my calculator, let's just check that. So we know that the two times three is six, so there's the root of six. And if I do the root of two, uh, multiplied by the root of three, and then do that, lo and behold, I get exactly the same value. So that's really, really important. And likewise, if I have the square root, uh, if I have the square root of x on y, that's the same as the square root of x divided by the square root of y. We can split these up. But also remember, what we do forwards, we can actually do backwards. So later on there are gonna be questions that like, ah, I'm gonna use this rule again. So if I have the square root of seven on four, he says drawing the shonkiest square root sign ever, then that's gonna be the square root of seven divided by the square root of four. And because I know what the square root of four is, I can split that up into root seven on two, all right? So these rules are gonna become incredibly important a bit later on. Simplifying thirds is just freaking awesome. Now, like fractions, we have to be able to simplify thirds. And if I had something, for example, as the root of 20, yes? Now, that can actually be simplified. How? Well, it all has something to do with square numbers. Now, remember, we can use the rule I'm highlighting here to split up square roots. And if I have a square number times some other number, I can remove that square number out and then square root it to give me a whole number. Did that make any sense? Nope, but this will. So I now know that the root of 20 is equal to four 
times five. Why did I choose four? Because it's a square number. And again, I've written the square numbers here, the most important ones. One other one I would actually put down as well is 400, which is 20 times 20. They're the ones we tend to use the most in mathematics. So if I can split up 20 or 200 or whatever else into the product of a square number and another number, life becomes easy. Why? Because now I can use my rule. Remember, I've got four times five under root sign. I can split that up into root four times root five, which gives me two root five. And there we go. That is simplified. Again, if I bring up my calculator and just prove, if we do root 20, hit enter. And if I do two root five, he says, try and hit the button, hit enter, and lo and behold, out comes the same value. So there we go. So simplifying these things, what about? I said root of, let's choose 72. Right? Why am I going to choose 72? Well, again, I know that's the same as 36 times 2. Why did I choose 36? Because it's a square number. And when I get a square number, I can actually write that as root 36 times root 2, which is 6 root 2. Now, simplifying these things is awesome because in a moment we're going to be adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing them and actually having them simplified makes life a lot, lot simpler. And in fact, for math, you have to simplify them. Much like a fraction, if you don't simplify a third, it could theoretically be wrong. Okay, so here are some other examples again taken from the Cambridge uh, Essentials Textbook series. Root 32. So root 32, what number is going to go now? 1, 4, 9... 16, 16 goes in there, so that's going to be the root of 16 times 2, which is the root of 16, times the root of 2, which is 4 root 2. There we go. That's that one done. 3 root 200. Now notice in this situation, 3 root 200. We can have these numbers outside. Between that number and the square root sign is a kissy kissy. It's just the times. So that can be split up into 3 times. Now 200, what square number goes in there, or the highest square number is 100. 100 times 2, and he says extending that over there, so 3 times the square root of 100 times the square root of 2, which gives me 3 times 10 times root 2, which is 30 root 2. And notice the 3 times the 10, we multiply it, we simplify that. Now you're going to say, well, hold on a moment, all your examples got root 2s in them. I know, I know, I know. It doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be that way. Now we get to division 5, root 40, divided by 6. Now, word of warning, when you have numbers on the tops and the bottoms of fractions, you still have to cancel those. Not the one under the 40 for the moment, but I actually can split 40 up into 5 times. Now, what does root 40, the highest number that goes into there? Uh, 1, 4, 9, 1, 4. So it's going to be 4. So it's going to be root 4 times 10 divided by 6, and then simplify that. He says write the 6 down. So it becomes 5 times root 2, uh, <coughs> 5 times root 4 times root 10, all divided by 6, which gives me 5 times 2 times root 10 on 6. Now, we know that the 2 can cancel in there, and the 2 can cancel in there to give me 3 times, so that gives me 5 root 10 on 3. And the final example, he says, having run out of room elsewhere, so we'll now do root he says do the root all the way over. So root 75 on 9 gives me, that we know that we can split that up into the root of 75 divided by the root of 9. Now the root of 75, don't get tricked. They're trying to trick me with the bottom because your brain's going to go, but root 9 is 3 and you're going to leave it there. But we also have to work out root of 75 because we know that that's the same as 25 times uh, 3 all on root 9 which gives me a root 25 times root 3 on root 9, which gives me, he says, not writing this straight at all, root uh, 5 root 3 divided by 3. And can we simplify that anymore? Not at all. All right, so simplifying this stuff is great. And later on in another video, they're going to try and trick you. All right, so remember, we have to be able to do things forwards and backwards. And in many cases, the words in a question might say, write as a square root of a positive integer. So if I look at the example here, 3 root 5, that is not the square root of one positive integer. We have two positive integers there, one outside and one inside. So what's this effectively reverse the process? How am I going to do that? Well, I now know that 3 is the same as the square root of 9 times by the square root of 5. And now because I've got a square root times a square root, I can combine them to give me 9 times 5, which is the square root 
of 45. So doing it backwards, notice how I've written the three as the square root of nine to make my life that little bit simpler. Here are some questions of doing things backwards. So we've got two root five, two root five, in which case we know that two is the square root of four times root five, which gives me the square root of four times five, which gives me root of 20. And seven root two, seven root two is the same as root 49 times the root of two, which gives me the root of 98. See, once you've got these down and you know your square numbers, you can reverse them backwards and forwards, life becomes so much easier. All right, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you haven't already done so, can you subscribe on my YouTube channel? I'm never going to be rich. And I'm certainly never going to be famous, but uh, it just helps me know that you are watching. For every click and every subscriber, it just means I'm not sitting in a room talking to myself. Otherwise, there are more videos coming on SIRDS. Um, it's been really good to see you. Take care. Have a good day. Stay safe. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.